passages. Our scripture reading this morning is found from the book of Exodus chapter 12 as we continue this study on Jewish days and festivals. And the festivals always have a day attached to them that seems to be more important than the others. The festivals tend to cover a period of time. But let us read together from Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 to 23. And will you stand, please, for the reading of God's word? We stand out of respect for the word of God. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the doorframe. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and the sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and to strike you down. Thank you. You may be seated. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his own holy word. And I want to emphasize again that phrase in verse 23. The Lord will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and to strike you down. Later, we're going to be talking about protection. The Passover. The Passover is celebrated, yes, by Jewish people annually to memorialize this most prominent of events in the Old Testament and in their national history. In what is called a Seder dinner, and which is celebrated here at our church biannually, the Jewish people annually meet and eat a very special dinner to memorialize this event. That's how important it is to them and to their national ethnic history. On the night of a Seder dinner, the youngest of the children will ask these questions. Why is this night of Pesach, a word used synonymously with Passover, but the meaning of which is important, and we'll get to that later. Why is this night of Pesach so different from all the nights of the year? The youngest child continues with question number two. On all other nights, we may eat either leavened or unleavened bread. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? Question number three. On all other nights, we may eat any species of herbs. Why on this night do we eat only bitter herbs? Question number four of the five. On all other nights, we do not dip even once. Why on this night do we dip twice? And lastly, on all other nights, we eat and drink, either sitting or reclining. Why on this night do we all recline? All of this to memorialize the Passover, an event that most of us as Christian people understand clearly represents Calvary and the death of Jesus. And if you're here today and you're a guest, and I neglected to welcome our guests, and I'm sorry about that, guests, if you're here, welcome. Thank you for coming. We have a gift for you. It's a very nice ballpoint pen. It's on the table in the lobby as you leave. Attached to the pin will be a card. If you want more information on our church, take one minute or less to fill out the card and just leave it on the table and we'll get information to you. But by all means, take the nice pin with you. It has a rubber tip on it for your smartphone or your iPad. Some of our guests may not understand that, but those of us who were raised in evangelical churches or Bible-teaching churches have probably already heard many times over that the Passover is to the Old Testament what Calvary is to the New, that the Passover for Israel represents the death of Jesus on the cross for the church, that the Passover lamb taken and hid away in the house 
for four days, actually three, and on the fourth day, sacrifice, so it could be examined and found to be unblemished, represents Jesus, our Savior, who, after riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey during the Passover week, was examined for three days, examined in the temple by the Pharisees and by the people, the first tribunal, the people in general at the temple who could find no blemish, no fault in this Lamb of God. And on the second day, the tribunal of the Sanhedrin, who could find no fault, no blemish in this Lamb of God, sent to redeem the world. And finally, on the third day, examined by Pilate, the Roman government, the powers that be at that time, and found to be without blemish, without fault. But on the fourth day, crucified the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, just as on the fourth day the Passover Lamb itself was slain. There was really only one Passover. But we remember it through our Seder dinner, and we remember it as we read the Old Testament, a representation of Christ. And by the way, I can go on with that representation because at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, when he was on the cross, dying for the sins of the world, that was the time when the lamb on the Passover day was slain by the priests at the temple. And when he cried, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, that was the moment when the blood of the Passover lamb, the actual lamb that was slain, the representative lamb, the Day of Atonement lamb, the lamb for the sins of the nation. Its blood was poured into a goblet and the priest was on his way to enter behind the veil into the Holy of Holies. And when Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, the veil is split from the top to the bottom. And there stands the priest. No longer is this old dispensation, this, this old way of doing things acceptable. Now the way to God is open to all through the blood of Jesus. So this is the Passover, and this is celebrated by the Jewish people today. It is one of their holy days. It is a festival, but it is a solemn and mournful festival. They eat bitter herbs to remind them of their sins that led them into bondage in the first place. But eventually, of course, they celebrate the fact that they have been freed from their sins and given hope, liberty, and life while the angel of death visited the others. The first Passover, this is an artist's rendition of the first Passover. And as I've already explained, we draw personal, not national or ethnic lessons from the Passover of Exodus chapter 12. We see Jesus and the cross anticipated in every act of the Passover dinner. From the lamb selected without blemish and examined for three days, and of course during that three-day period of time becoming a household pet. Jesus, his three years of ministry, examined by all, becoming not only a topic of controversy, but also an object of affection and love for those who knew him and followed him. That household pet being taken and slain for their sins, bringing much pain to the lives of those who had guarded that pet for three days, the death of Jesus on the cross, bringing much pain to his followers as they observed him. The similarities are very real. Israel was in bondage to Pharaoh and enslaved in Egypt. Deliverance was the need. And deliverance came through the ten plagues. And every one of those plagues was intended 
to demonstrate to all the world, and especially to the Hebrews and the Egyptians, that the deities which the Egyptians worshipped were false deities. Now, in our sophisticated age today, we no longer bow the knee to crude idols or before a mountain that we might think have magical powers. But every one of those deities of ancient Egypt, and by the way, that was the premier civilization of its time, and so what happens there in the Passover is known throughout the world because the news travels. It doesn't travel quite as fast in that day as it does in ours, but it did travel along the trading routes and from the traders back into the, every nook and cranny of the world. And so it was known what happened that every one of these deities which represented an aspect of life that even in our own hearts today we crave could not deliver Egypt, nor can our gods. Our deities. On Thursday night, we began a Bible study for the young adults. It's called Gods at War. And while there is some allusion to the ancient deities and primitive cultures even today that have these idols of stone, the thrust of this uh, Bible study is that they had deities that represented the very things we bow down to today as well. Because our hearts are the same as theirs. Our hearts haven't changed. They had a named deity that represented pleasure. We just bow to pleasure in all of its forms and worship pleasure. They had a named deity that represented power. We just bow to power and seek it, no matter whom we have to step on or whose life we attempt to destroy. They had a named deity that represented wealth. We just go after it and bow our knee to wealth itself. We don't give control of these pleasures or sexual desires or wealth or power or fame. We don't give them unto a named deity. We take them for what they are, but our hearts bow to them regardless, and we pursue them with all of our being. And as we made clear in our first of the six sessions, God's at war, whatever or whoever we pursue becomes our God. Well, the Egyptians had ten gods, deities, to whom they bowed the knee. But all of them represented some aspect of life that we experience in our day as well. One of those deities represented sexual pleasure. Many in our society pursue that with all they have. It's become their deity, though it doesn't have such a name. Some sheer pleasures, some wealth, some power, and so on and so forth. Finally, we get to the 10th plague. And by the way, that is an interesting historical study, if you're interested in Bible history, to identify those deities and how they are impotent before the living God as our deities become impotent in our lives as well before the living God. But finally, they come to the 10th deity, and this, of course, is the... the crux of it. This, is, this becomes the great crisis moment. And in this crisis moment, the Egyptian deity Ra is brought into the conversation. Ra, the sun god. All life comes from the sun, it was thought. He is the primary deity. He is the number one deity of all the deities. You got him, and then everything else is a subcategory. So Ra will give us life. He always does. He always has. He always will. And with that, the angel of death moves over the land. 
and Ra is shown to be impotent. Life. Life. Life in all of its meaning. Life in, in everything that it represents. Life. That's what we crave. Eternal life. To know God. To know God through Jesus Christ is life. And everything else will fail. I was at a Billy Graham gathering for pastors several years ago now when uh, Mr. Graham introduced one of our guest speakers who was an evangelist with a denominational church and taught evangelism to those people. And he mentioned that he had come through the airport just on his way to this conference, which the one I attended was in Asheville, North Carolina. I've actually been to two of them. One was in Toronto. This one was in Asheville. North Carolina. He said he'd come through the airport and he'd met cultists. They were actually, they were called Hare Krishna at that time, a Indian, um, Hinduish sort of cult, kind of an offshoot of Hinduism, of which there are many offshoots, by the way. When you have any religion with over a thousand deities, you're going to have several offshoots. And so they were in the airport, and they were passing out pamphlets. And he said, I'll take your pamphlet if you'll take mine. Okay, said a young fellow. He said, here's my business card also, said the Christian evangelist. He said, I want you to keep it handy, because I know this. Eventually, your God will fail you. But my God never failed. He arose from the grave. When that time comes and your God fails you, you call me. My God never fails. He said that just that morning, he'd only been in Asheville about three days. It was a week-long conference. He said just that morning his phone rang, and it was that fellow from the airport who said, tell me more about your God. I don't think my God is able. So God Almighty sends the angel of death to pass over the lamb. And only those who have taken the Passover lamb, slain it, and put its blood on the door frame at the top and on either side are saved. Now there's also blood at the bottom because that's where the lamb was slain. So the blood is already there on the bottom. And you have two representations in that that are important. First, the cross. Those who have friends or family who are of the Catholic persuasion know that frequently their prayers both begin and end with the sign of the cross. And that's the representation of the blood on the doorposts as well as on the bottom. But it also represents the four corners of the earth, north, south, east, west telling us that the blood of Jesus is for all men at all times in all places. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world, the world of mankind. There are some lessons to be learned, I think, the first is the reality of divine judgment. We want to never get away from the fact that God is a moral being, supremely moral, and he will have the final say about the events of life. He has said, both in the Old Testament and in the New, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. In my counseling ministry, I have, on numerous occasions, had the sad occasion to speak to individuals who have been treated unjustly. And they have been. They've been mistreated, they've been abused. They've been rejected, they've been forsaken, they've been abandoned, and the pain lingers for years. 
Finally, sometimes in a state of desperation, they come to me and they say, help me get over this. I just can't get over it. I'm so angry. And this anger eats away at me. I try to get rid of this anger through alcohol, over-medicating, over-exercising, overeating, under-eating, working, going to church even, but always in my moments of quietness, it comes back. It comes back. It comes back. And it inflicts pain. I said, well, what? why is that? What are you looking for? And usually the answer is, I'm looking for revenge. I want to get even. And my question always to them, and I share this with you because I want you to know this, my question to them then always is, well, what is even? What is even? You want to get even? What is even? Can you tell me what even is? If you get even, you're only upping the ante, aren't you? You don't know what even is, and you never will. But God knows. Give it to Him. Trust Him. the judgment day will come. When God will make all wrongs right, He is a supremely moral being, and He will have the final say. He had the final say with Pharaoh, and He'll have the final say for the world. Now, when we talk about divine judgment, and of course the Passover is a time of divine judgment, we relate that to the cross. And we are saying, God has the final say regarding our sin. It was laid upon Jesus. That's divine judgment as well. The judgment that should be handed out to me for my sin was absorbed by Christ at the cross. God has the final say there as well. There is nothing more I can add to what Jesus has done for me. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. The divine judgment placed upon Jesus handles the sin question in its entirety. There's nothing more we can add for our salvation. Jesus has done it all. But having said that, let us never forget that even as Christian people, someday we will stand before God. As Philippians chapter 2 reminds us, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He didn't send him into this world to suffer, to die on the cross, and to be raised from the grave so we could ignore him, but rather so that we could exalt him. And when every knee bows, and when every tongue confesses, it will either be the knee and the tongue of a believer who has served and who will hear the reply, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord, or it will be the knee and the tongue of one who has rejected and defied the Lord Jesus Christ. And to him will be said, I cast you out into outer darkness. There is coming such a day. In Romans chapter 14, we are told for the believer these words, and this is written to believers, by the way, Romans 14. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. We will. Our attitudes, our conduct, our behavior, we will give an account of ourselves to God. And for those who are unbelievers, Revelation 20 reminds us that John sees in the future a great white throne, and on him and on it was seated an individual 
earth, and the sky fled from his presence, and there was no place to hide. No more hiding. And the books were opened. One is the book of life. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. Divine judgment is real. By the way, I had two clicks I meant to give. There's the judgment for believers. Each of us will give an account of ourselves to Christ. And there's the judgment for the unbeliever. Revelation 20, the great white throne. Well, let's take this idea of the Passover. We've tried to work it into the Christian framework because it does anticipate the Christian era and the work of Jesus on the cross and our deliverance personally, whereas the Passover was a national and an ethnic experience for the Hebrews. The work of Jesus on the cross is for the person, the individual, and we understand that. I hope we understand that. And whereas the lamb was unblemished and examined for three days before sacrifice, so Jesus was unblemished and examined before the tribunals of his time, a day at a time, day number one, uh, the country, the people, the, uh, the average person, the common people at the temple, day number two, the Sanhedrin, day number three, the Roman government, no fault, no blemish, sent to the cross anyway. What can we draw from this as lessons? Of course, the shedding of the blood, the giving of the blood is all important in the Passover story and in the story of Calvary. That's why the blood is put on the doorpost above the head to either side, and of course, the puddle of blood from the slaying of the, the lamb at the floor. The blood is all important. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. The effect of the paschal blood, paschal means Passover, the first effect is that of protection. He will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Protection. Do you remember the first question the little child asks in the Jewish family when the Seder is given? Why is this night of Pesach? So different than the other nights of the year. Pesach and Passover are interchangeable words. But the word Pesach literally means protection. It was the night of protection. The night of protection for the Hebrews. The night of protection for Israel. The blood of Jesus is our protection. Now if we walk in the light as he is in the light, 1 John 1 says, we have fellowship with one another. That's with the living God. And the blood of Jesus, his son, is continually cleansing us from sin. That's our protection. That's how we know we have eternal life. That's how we know we're right with God. That's how we know we're going to heaven because the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us from sin. None of us will ever fully understand the atonement in all of its ramifications and all that it means, I happen to be, believe, and this is personal, I always like to distinguish between the Bible says this and this is what I think. This is what I think now. I happen to believe that when we go to heaven, that a great portion of our time, and I hope for my sake, a great portion of the time is spent learning I want to learn more about the atonement. I want to learn more about God. I want to learn more. I just want to learn. I think that when the Apostle Paul uses the phrase in 1 Corinthians 13, now we see through a veil darkly. Yeah, now we look. I think the newer versions say now we look through a mirror darkly. Yeah, we do. We do. I'd like to learn more. I don't think any of us will absorb all that the atonement teaches in this life. But here is something. The blood of Jesus protects us and keeps our souls safe. The Psalms 
are often called the Psalms of David, and they are. He is the primary author of the Psalms. But there are a couple of Psalms that he did not author. And if you read the headings prior to the Psalms, you will see that. Some are written by one of the music directors, and there are two or three of them mentioned in the Psalms, so I can't recall their names. But there are two of Moses. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Psalm 90 and Psalm 91 are the Psalms of Moses, which were lying there, uh, David's nightstand, I suppose, and as he was writing the Psalms and writing his Psalms, his songs, the Lord seemed to impress upon him, put those in there too. So he did. Well, if they're the Psalms of Moses, we understand then, don't we? This takes us back to the days of the Passover. Here's what Moses says in Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. Remember the word Pesach, used synonymously with Passover, means protection. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. When the children of Israel took the blood of the Passover lamb and spread it on the doorframe, up and either side, and they took it from the threshold, so all four areas were covered. When they did that, they were then dwelling in the shelter of the Most High. They were then resting in the shadow of the Almighty. And when we, by faith, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the blood that He shed on the cross to deliver us from sin and from judgment and from condemnation, then we are, by faith, dwelling in the shelter of the Most High and resting in the shadow of the Almighty. By the way, this concept from Passover, that you are now in the shelter of the Most High. He's sheltering you because of your obedience to Him and your faith in this blood. You're dwelling in His shadow, resting in His shadow, I should say. As He passes over you and those who don't believe experience the death of the firstborn. You're dwelling in His shelter. You're resting in His shadow. Those of us who believe in Jesus and in His blood are, by faith, resting in His shadow and dwelling in His shelter just as well. Now Moses took this idea, and it became part of the tabernacle and the temple worship. For in the tabernacle, which was a tent, and in the temple, which was a building, there were figures in the canvas of the tent, stitched in the holy place and in the most holy place. Stitchings of angelic beings, angels, so that every time the priests walked into the holy place, and there were the candlesticks and the showbread, and, uh, yeah, whatever else. Every time he walked in there, he would see the angels. In the temple, they would walk into the holy place, and then the high priest into the holy of holies. And there painted on the ceiling were the angels, the angelic beings. And every time they walked into the tent of the tabernacle or the building of the temple and would see these replicas of angels, they would know they are now dwelling in the shelter of the Most High and resting in the shadow of the Almighty. We too are surrounded by God's angels. We too are protected by God's angels. We too, whether we see them or not, doesn't matter. 
what the Old Testament priests saw were just artists' rendition. They didn't see the real thing. Whether we see them or not doesn't matter, but they are here. We are, through the blood of Jesus, dwelling in the shelter of the Most High and resting in the shadow of the Almighty. God is indeed our refuge and our fortress in whom we may trust. Pesach, protection. The blood of Jesus protects us. Secondly of all, the Passover spoke of cleansing. That's an erroneous verse. It's supposed to be Exodus 11, verse 7, by the way. So that's an error. It was my error, not the person who did the slide. She's fixing lunch for me today, and I want to eat. <laughs> so please let her know that I said it was my mistake, not hers. Verse 7. Cleansing. And I can see I need to move along here. So let me just say this by cleansing. The unleavened bread also represented cleansing as well. But here's the thing on cleansing. Uh, Exodus eleven seven. 7. God says this. I'm going to pass over. This is going to happen because I want a distinction to be made between the Hebrew and the non-Hebrew, between the believer and the unbeliever, between the Israelite and the Egyptian. All the world will know, all the world will see that God cleanses his people and makes them ready for heaven. And the blood of Jesus does that for us. And then finally, substitution. I know some of you jot these verses down. Remember, the second one is Exodus 11, verse 7, not 12. Finally, substitution, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. What can I say about this? The primary reason Jesus went to the cross was to be my substitute. If you open a book of theology, some of you have such books, many of you don't. If you open a book of theology and go to the atonement, it will say something along the lines of, here are the various reasons for Jesus going to the cross. And it'll be one, two, three, four, five, six. Here's usually six, eight reasons given, a half dozen anyway. He did this, 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 this. The primary reason, number one, was he died for me. He died in my place. Inscribed over the entryway to this worship center is 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Christ died for our sins. Now, the reason I emphasize that is because in some seminaries and some even books of theology, they kind of diminish that reason. It's put down there as reason number four or number five or number three. It's number one in the Bible. Jesus died for me. He died so I could live. And isn't that, after all is said and done, what Passover is all about? The lamb died, its blood was spread, and now I live. Others die because they don't believe it and they don't do it. But I live, and I'm on my way to Canaan. And Jesus says, believe in me, trust in my blood, you will live, and you'll be on your way to heaven. Let us pray. And as we go to prayer this morning, perhaps there are friends here today who have not made a commitment of faith to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. We would not want to close the service without an opportunity being given you to know that there are friends here at the front who want to meet with you and pray with you. Rick and Linda Grissom, Jim and Penny Frederick. Rick and Jim are deacons, their wives, deaconesses. They are here because they care about you. Let them pray with you. Let them answer your questions. Let them help you. While others leave to go out to their cars and to go home, you just slip up to the front and have your questions answered. 
Dear Father, today we have looked at this Jewish festival and feast day, the Passover. We've seen how it anticipates the coming of Jesus, the Lamb of God, into this world and his death on the cross. Our embracing of that sacrifice by Jesus on the cross is what enables us to receive from you eternal life. May we not take it for granted. May we be grateful souls, and may we live the life that you've given us before the world. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father, and may the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us all till our Savior come and evermore. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.